Thank you. Uh, first, I need to say I didn't come up with the title. <laughs> I have a friend who was helping me out, um, trying to make it so a bit more snazzy, which he's very good at. It is, it is right? So, um, yeah, well done, Ramon. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, today I'm giving a talk that's not super technical, but more focused on communities, community events, because that's the other thing that I like to do. And, um, yeah, so my name is Leanne. I'm a developer advocate at Loft Labs. Right now, my colleague Rich Burroughs, he's also uh, giving a talk at the other room, which is a bit more technical about um, one of the tools that we built. So if you want something a bit more hard skilly, um, it's okay if you want to check out his talk, I, I allow it. Otherwise, I'm happy that uh, you, you're here to join me for this presentation. All right. So as I said before, I'm a developer advocate with Love Labs. Um, I have been um, in tech about like 12, 11 years now. Um, I'm just going to start like a little bit about myself because it like will tie into the story that I'm telling today. Um, so I think I must have been around 11 or 12, the first time that I kind of did stuff with computers, like building websites, like built my own HTML-based website and stole some JavaScript snippets from around the internet to make it a bit more interactive. And that's when I figured like, hey, this is quite fun. But um, at the same time, what I really wanted to do is kind of like save the world. I wanted to like do good for you know the people around me. Um, I always wanted to make things better for myself, and I realized that if you do stuff for other people, if other people are happy and content with their lives, they won't take your shit and they won't like make your life miserable. So that was something that I kind of like got quite early. I'm like, okay, so maybe the way to like do good for me is to do good to, uh, do good stuff for others. So um, what I did was uh, I wanted to become a lawyer. So uh, I went to law school for about three years, and um, I was politically active. I was with the Social Democrats before, uh, like when I was about 16, I joined the Social Democrats. And then for university, I joined the Pirate Party. Um, I was a member of the student parliament for the Pirate Party and did that for about yeah two years or so. And um, I did that, but I kind and I, I always felt like I'm doing something very important, but it wasn't very fun. So politics is not fun, and everyone who's ever done anything for politics or even just is interested in it probably knows. And when you are in politics, there usually is a point in your life where you have to decide whether you want to s like live your life for yourself now or live a public life, right? Like where you, your life is kind of in service to the public. So I decided to rather just live for myself. Um, so I left politics, and at the same time, I also wanted to didn't want to continue down with law school anymore because I found it to be pretty boring, actually, very dry. And as I said again, it's like it was just a constant tilting at windmills. That's how it felt like. like I felt like this is very important what I'm doing, but at the same time, it just didn't give me anything. So instead, I decided to go and um, do something that I remembered that I liked, which was like do stuff with computers. So um, yeah, I didn't want to go to university again. Instead, I did an apprenticeship in Germany. Um, that's where I'm from. And you basically go to school and then go uh, have like um, uh, practical work at a company. So what I did was I. Um, joined a games company, which is already a great start into the industry. Um, this was a browser games company. Again, like, I'm just uh, scraping the bottom of the barrel there. Um, and it was okay. I mean, it wasn't the worst. Uh, there was a lot of sexism. There was a lot of racism, obviously, as a gaming company. Um, I think that I was probably an adequate engineer. I was good enough. I mean, I could pick things up when I need them to, I can understand things when you explain them to me, but I was just never super passionate about like, oh yeah, this paradigm or this technology, oh my god, I want to like spend my life just figuring that out. Um, but yeah, it was okay. And then I, like, I went to a um, community event, it was like a PHP user group because everything was PHP, and it was, I hated it, it was absolutely terrible. Not because HP, I mean, th that's not their fault, but the thing was, <laughs> everyone was super close. Like, it was a very close group. They were friends, and it just felt super exclusive. So uh, we went to this 
it was like a, um, yeah, like there was some guy had a talk, and then the audience was like making sexual remarks. They were like, woo, take it off. And those were, the audience were women. Those are two women and uh, some guy. And I mean, they were joking. It was obviously fun, but I, to me, it just it felt absolutely terrible. I, I hated it. It was just, I was very uncomfortable. I just didn't feel like I belong here and this is not for me. This is obviously like a group of friends just meeting each other. So I thought like, Tech events are shit, and I never want to network because it's just terrible. Um, so I left that company. I went to another company um, with people who were much more my speed, I would say. And uh, they organized a unconference, JavaScript unconference in Hamburg. So the thing about an unconference is that the topics are not in, um, decided on in advance. Instead, you go to the thing on the day everyone who wants to propose a talk can propose it and then you d you vote in person you get like two sticky points or something and then you vote on the topics so um do we lose connection here oh, okay i'm good oh that's oh you hmm, didn't prepare that okay fine um so that was completely different like the people were so super supportive i did my first lightning talk there i did my first full talk there and I almost cried because people were just so nice and open and, and welcoming. And I'm like, oh, actually, this is not too bad. And this was the very first time I was in tech for like three years by then. That was the very first time that I felt like I have a space here. Like I actually felt like I belong somewhere. And people want me here and people want to listen to what I have to say. And like, it's just something that I can give to people and I get something back. And since then, I've like that feeling was so important to me. It was like such a turn for me in my career that I feel like this is what I want to do with the, for the rest of my life. I want other people to feel the exact same way, to have that thing where they're like, this is where I belong. So that's what it, we'll be talking about probably most of the time. And uh, I forgot to continue my notes because I can't see them. So um, yeah, a bit of a disclaimer. I'm going to, the reason why I'm came up with this talk was because there were a couple of things that happened recently where community events were putting out um, speaker lineups and then it was only men, for example. And um, I, will, I will talk about some things. I will talk about some behaviors and maybe you feel like, oh, this is and why are you me now? Maybe, could happen. If you feel this way, I invite you to just sit with that feeling of unease and affront, I don't know, um, and just kind of like think through why you feel this way. Instead of directly reacting like, oh, shut up. Um, just like understand like why, why do I feel attacked now? Because it's not my intention to attack anyone. It's not my intention to like point at a person. But there are some behaviors that I think is very important to talk about. And um, the other thing is that um, people are very complicated and having values and principles can also be very complicated. Like organizers are, to me, they're the heart of our communities or like just community organizers. And organizers are doing the best that they can. And at the same time, organizers can do better. And these might sound paradoxical, but they're not. Like two things can be true at the same time. And in this, ca in this case, I think, both of these are true. Um, I do think that if you do anything for the community, you understand like how much love and hard work and everything goes into it. And it's important that we respect that and we see that as a labor of love. At the same time, it's also important that we hold each other accountable. So if you see something that an organizer does that you don't like, remember that maybe talk to them instead of dragging them on Twitter. Like, you know, I know the, the likes and everything, but it's not an adversarial situation. Like we are supposed to like help each other out in the community. So I don't, I don't see the point in like first going to Twitter and then going to the person that you know could change something about it. So um, those are some some disclaimers that I think are important to to just mention at the beginning before I start into my rants. All right. So um, communities can serve a lot of functions, you know, and um, I have to read what I wrote there. Oh, um, so they can be, for some people, communities are safe spaces. And for other people, communities are a place where you get confronted or get inspired by 
new ideas and new people. And sometimes these things are kind of at odds against each other. So as community organizers, we have to kind of make a decision of where do we draw the lines. And um, I'm so sorry, I, <laughs> I really need to like look over there. Um, right, so sometimes we forget that even the smallest things can be communities or can be platforms. For example, since I got here, I've just like every single person I know or the friend of a person I know, I asked them like, do you want to join us for dinner? It's a small thing, I'm just organizing a dinner. But for some people, if, for example, if you're at the beginning of your career, sitting next to Duffy, sitting next to the founder of company, whatever, this can be a place that it can turn your entire life around. It can turn your entire career around. So you can't forget how much power you have just by having connections to someone, just by making friends with someone. And at the same time, there's also like some responsibility towards it. If you're going to have a dinner, and you know there's a one person who's just always a dick to everyone, maybe just don't invite that person. Because you do have, what well, I think I have a responsibility to the other people that will join the dinner that I'm trying to put on. No, Adrian is okay, he can come. Um, at the same time also, you know, a lot of people, when I do like Twitter spaces or something, there's a lot of people who want to get into DevRel or something like that, and they ask, like, some people have asked me, how do, become a, how do I become a member of a community? I'm like, you are already a member of the community. You're already here, you're taking part, you are filling up space, you clearly are already a member of the community, and maybe every time you ask a question or you like, you use your voice and you take up space, you might already be a leader. Not everyone will agree with what you say, but that doesn't mean that what you say and what you do doesn't have weight. You know, sometimes you, you influence people in ways that you don't even know. And I think this is something that you should be aware of, that to me it was really getting into that speaking thing that was just such, it just really, yeah, as I said, just turned my life around completely. And I, the, the power that those, those organizers had to help me with my career is something that I think, yeah, we should all be aware of, that we could really make or break someone's career, even if we're just, you know, going to a conference or going to a dinner. Um, yeah, so this talk is mostly probably going to be about diversity and inclusion because that's the fancy word. I don't think it's necessarily about, you know, your identity or what you look like. It's more about just generally what, it, what does it mean to have a good community. And the thing is that doing work specifically to improve community is really, really hard and you have to actively decide to do it. Um, as I said before, if you've ever done anything for the community, organized an event or something, it is really tough. There's a lot of work already. And then on top of that, you're trying to make it extra safe for people. You're trying to make it like get, invite diverse speakers or whatever. It's really hard and you have to actively remember to do it. You have to actively confront your own biases while you're doing it. And that can be very uncomfortable. Like, for example, I've been um, following more disability um, advocates recently and there's a lot of criticism that really hurts me because I feel like oh I'm doing that and I do it with the best of intentions but I just don't have the understanding and the context to know what I'm doing is actually not helping because I am not disabled myself so I needed to learn how to sit with those feelings and be like okay this does feel kind of uncomfortable, but it's not about me, right? I'm trying to learn something about other people and how I can, can help other people and be an ally to people who are less um, privileged than I am. So really, my discomfort is not the important thing here. Um, and yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of tough. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's, it's something that if you start doing it, it will get easier over time. So like all the diversity and inclusion efforts, the more diverse and inclusive your communities are, it's almost like an exponential curve. So for example, I'm um, one of the organizers of um, a serverless, day, serverless Days Amsterdam, which is a serverless focused community that's also dev similar to DevOps Days, they have like a global um, organization and then individual chapters. And when we did the first conference in 2019, we had three 
female, like we had three proposals from female speakers out of like 70 or something. So clearly it was like, this community is just not very diverse. So what we did after the conference was we were, we started to do monthly meetups. We tried to really actively um, improve the, the diverse makeup of the community itself. And then one of the things that I'm most proud of actually is that after like a year, we had an event with two female hosts, two female speakers, and we didn't even try to get there. It just happened because people were, especially if you invite women or you know, people of color or people who are marginalized in some way, sometimes what they will do is they will watch some videos first. They will talk to other people who have been to your events first to know, to learn whether it's safe or not. And the more women you have had, you have had on before, the more likely it is that you will, you know, that more women will be, um, feel like it's safe to speak or like they will know that their friend has spoken there before. So it will get easier over time. You just, it's at the beginning, then yeah, it will get easier over time. Um, so this is the thing that I think is very important to a lot of people who are people pleasers. Um, I once was invited to speak at a women in tech conference and I, as I said before, I always look up a bit more information. I ask people who have been there before. And I saw that their speaker lineup was 50% male. So I, I asked the organizer, that seems a bit weird, because if this is about women in tech, how is it 50% male? And she was like, um, we, wanted to be <laughs> we wanted it to be more diverse. So <laughs> they had to invite male speakers, apparently, because that's diversity in their mind. Um, also, they, they, got some, they got some feedback that they would wish that more men would attend the conference. So they thought, oh, how do we get more men to attend? Easy, we get more men to speak. So I was like, I'm not gonna speak at a women in tech event that's 50% male. It doesn't make sense. I don't think you really understand what, you're, what you want to achieve. Organize, there was one woman who was organizing it. She was really, she was really pissed. Like she really, she like, I was like, I don't know how to make everyone happy. I'm just trying to do my best and like, I can't believe you're criticizing me like that. And I think the problem that she had was that she didn't have any core values that she could fall back on to make these decisions. Instead, she was just trying to like, hmm, maybe I should do this, maybe I should do this. Because she didn't really know what is the, the core mission of my event. If my core mission is telling stories of women in tech, I'm never not going to invite men to do that because how would they know? How could they tell those stories? If it was like showcasing diversity in tech or showcasing women in tech, same thing applies. But the fact that she didn't have those core values just meant that every time she had to make a decision like that, she was just kind of like, eh, what should I do? I don't know. Oh my God, I'm trying my best. And I believe her, she was trying her best. She was just not thinking about what exactly it was that she's doing and like what the consequences of her actions were, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, if you want to run a community event or something, you need to think about what's your core value, what's your core mission. For serverless days, for example, it is, we have three uh, values, which is accessibility, um, diversity, and, uh, oh no, I forgot the third one. Damn, it's been like a long time. Anyhow, so it's just three of them, and then you kind of like, it's like your North Star, your prime directive. You can make all, all the other decisions kind of based on your three most important or two or one most um, So another, something that follows from that idea of core, core values. Um, so I'm gonna be, I learned a lot of stuff from things in the community. One of them is Kim Creighton. Um, yeah, she's quite well known, I think, and she's amazing. Because she not only does she is she very good at kind of like making us see the the systems and the institutions that oppress people, but also she gives us the tools to overcome those systems. And one of the things that she said that really sticks with me is intention without strategy is chaos. Because there are so many companies out there who are like, oh yeah, diversity inclusion, blah blah blah, and like put a like put a rainbow on their brand logo, or whatever. When it's that that time of the year, um, but then what are you actually doing, right? Like, there have been more than one companies who are like, oh, we're gonna put some time and effort into like making a rainbow logo, and like, okay, but what are we actually doing? Are we 
maybe donating money to any um, organization? Are we gonna like showcase something for other the queer people in our company? Oh no, uh, yeah, um, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do that as well. Like, what's the what's the actual what what are you trying to achieve? What are your core values, and how are you actually getting there? And the same goes with community events. It's one thing to say we want a diverse lineup, okay, but how are you gonna get there? Are you only going? Are you just telling people, oh, please um, apply to our CFP? Fine. What happens if you still don't get enough women? Like, what, what, are, what is your plan B? How do you mitigate? Are you going to invite people to speak so you, you can be sure that you have at least like 50% female speakers? Whatever it is, you need to think about these things up front because by the time that you realize, oh shit, we don't have enough female speakers, you are so busy with a billion other things that this is just going to stress you out for no good reason. And you know it's going to happen, right? It's, it's very, very unlikely that you're actually going to get enough proposals from female speakers. And I also am not a huge fan of blind um, CFPs. I think that it's not necessarily, like the cure is not necessarily that we need to remove every single distinguishing feature from a proposal. It's like with interviews. I don't think it helps because the biases are still there. Like, even if I don't know what gender or uh, race this person is, maybe I'm biased because they write in a specific way that sounds more academic, something that I'm used to, or maybe it's because they, in their CV it says they went to college and I'm just more biased towards these people. It's more important that we understand what our biases are and then confront them than just trying to make every single application just like a gray blob and I just don't know exactly what kind of person it is. That's just, that's taking away from the quality of the proposal because it's more interesting to know, oh, this is actually a person of color, so their view on this is actually quite unique as opposed to if another white guy was talking about this. Uh, damn, I have really not set this up correctly. Anyhow, so coming to this other point where, okay, so you have a CFP open, you have like, three women who applied and you, you just don't have enough female speakers. Okay, what do you do? What do most events do? Hey, Ian Coldwater, or hey, I don't know, Kelsey Hightower. They will often go to the people who are already known, who like the few female people that, or non-cis-abled white men, cis-able-bodied white men, straight guys, you know. Um, Instead, they go to the people who already have so much exposure and such a big platform. And I don't think that's necessarily diverse either, because those are also not new ideas. And when you go to someone like Ian Coldwater, for example, who I really respect, it's not about Ian Coldwater, you are maybe taking away a chance for someone who has never spoken before, or someone who just doesn't have that same platform. So this is a quote from um, Jamila Jamil, who's you might know her as the actress who played Tahani in The Good Place. And she's talking about, like, the media will frame, w when there's, like, a new, I think in her case it was, like, a new Pakistani actress. And they were like, move aside, Jamila. Th there's a new brown woman in town or whatever. And she's like, no, I'm not going to move aside. You don't, like, stand, just stand next to me. So we make more space for people like us. So if you have two female speakers, Congratulations, well done. Don't stop there. Don't say, okay, now we have the two token women. See if you can like create more space. Maybe now you can invite someone who has never spoken before. Maybe now you can invite someone who's not in the DevOps space, in the Kubernetes space. Maybe invite like a designer or something. Maybe they have an interesting take, right? You can always do more. You can always create more space for more diverse options as long as you want to do that, as long as you see that and think about that. Um, Okay, so another, another thing is also, if you have a topic that you want to highlight at your event, you're like, oh, I want to event storming or whatever, and, but you only know dudes who speak about that, ask one of those guys, hey, do you maybe know someone who's not a white male who could also speak on that topic? It's not that hard. You just have to like make the, the extra bit of effort to kind of like go one step further. And then, then, then it will, as I said before, it will get easier over time. Because then you know those people and they can refer other people to you. So this is another thing that um, comes from Kim, where she explains kind of like the difference between diversity and inclusion, where 
Diversity is about reaching out to people outside of your bubble, outside of your community, to get them to join and to get them to show up. But then inclusion is about how do you keep those people there? Um, and I've, so far I've been talking mainly about diversity, but I think the inclusion part is maybe the, also a part that we kind of struggle with sometimes. And I just want to check how much time I still have. Five minutes? <laughs> okay. Oh, there it is, okay. All right, so this is a framework that I just came up with because I needed something to put on a slide. Um, and if you have any like ideas how I can improve on that, I, I would be happy to hear them because this is something that I just kind of threw together out of you know, the things that, that, that are important to me. Um, so A, B, C. A is for accessibility. Is your event or community accessible? And I don't mean is it accessible for people with mobility issues. I mean, is it affordable? Can single moms attend your thing? Do I have, am I, if I'm a woman, do I have to go through like a super dark parking garage to get to your thing, right? There's so many ways that we are making things not accessible for other people. Hackathons that are only on Saturdays, for example, when people maybe are caretakers and they don't have time for that. Um, so, yeah, you need to think about like how like, people who are not like me, people who don't have the same lifestyle that I do, is this still accessible for them? And of course, you can't know what you don't know, but the more, again, the more you reach out, the more you learn, and the more you will see things from their perspective and realize things that they didn't even tell you, but it's just like, oh, this is becoming more obvious to me now. Um, yeah. The next thing is behavior. This is um, because I didn't, couldn't find a better B word. So what is the general vibe of your event? Is it, is, is there like, sexualized imagery, for example, it's like are ads sexualized? Um, how are people, are they very vigilant to not use any um, gender language, like guys? Are they careful to not use ableist language, like crazy or mad or, you know, like, it's, that will give, if, if I'm a person who has been marginalized my entire life, I'm gonna be very, I'm gonna pick up on very minute details. And tiny, tiny things can make me feel unsafe, so, the more I see that there's just an, like, a, like a feeling of vigilance amongst the people, where it's like, I don't even want to get into like, the general area of offending someone, that will probably make me feel a bit safer. And the thing is, if you, like, I think I saw a tweet the other day, um, who you invite defines who you disinvite. So if you want to make a space more safe for marginalized people, it comes to the cost of people who are not very inclusive. And I always feel very bad when I exclude people because I, I think that's just, if I don't like someone, it's not, it doesn't make sense to exclude them in a professional manner. But if those are people who are just toxic all the time, like every, there's a guy actually in Valencia Rejects um, who is just someone that I don't like, but also every single time I'm in a community with him, he's just like, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. He's just being a dick. And then like, he wanted to join us for dinner, and I felt really bad that I didn't invite him, but then I thought, I did, it's not that I didn't invite him because I don't like him. I didn't invite him because he's a dick to every single person every time. So, yeah, again, it's about responsibility, and like, it's not about punishing him. It's about making things more safe and comfortable for the people that you, know, you want to help. So, what about things that are not necessarily tied to behavior, but things that really cross the line, code of conduct stuff. So I'm gonna make this a bit quicker because most of us probably know what a code of conduct is, but um, I used to be part of the global code of conduct team for Global Diversity CFP Day, which is a one-day workshop that aims to help marginalized people come up with their first tech talk. And because those are we were aiming specifically at marginalized people, we knew that we had to be extra vigilant to, to be sure that they're safe. So what we did, we developed a COC training and um, wrote down some scenarios so people could already kind of like pre-act um, out the situations in which they ha would have to act on um, COC violations. And the basic rules are make sure that there's people who are dedicated to COC to take like reports for CIC COC violations because you know everyone else was going to be busy. Um, make sure to listen to the person who reports, ask them how they would have the, like to have this handled, like be transparent about it, and if you also make it public, then 
this will also signal to other people, hey, we're taking this very seriously and you can feel safe because we really understand this is important. So yeah, check this out if you are interested in that. And, oh, here we are. Th this is like, take a picture of this. Make the COC very visible throughout the venue and during your events. Um, clarify what will happen if you violate the, um, if you violate the COC. If you can have multiple channels to report incidents, go for it, the more the better. Um, yeah, dedicated COC folks, someone reports, focus on them and be transparent. I already said that. All right. Uh, okay. I'm just gonna, just like, just don't make it about you. It's not about you, it's about the community as a whole. If a thing is hinges on one single person, it just doesn't scale. And this is what I did wrong a long time. I just tried to march on because I had this vision and I just felt terrible. And then as soon as I kind of like focused more on the community, focused more on like small things, improving small things for people around me, the easier it got because people would then give back to me, give that energy back to me. And together we were able to do something greater than you know, a single person could have ever done. And uh, that is the end of my talk. I'm just gonna say, Go and check out Kim's new book, Profit Without Oppression. It's going to be amazing. Kim is amazing, and I cannot thank her enough for giving me all the kind of input for this talk. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to recommend that people meet Leanne out in the common areas uh, over the rest of the day and ask questions there, because I think, I think mm. you made awesome points fundamentally about we're all learning this together and hold back judgment, if, especially if you're feeling attacked. Yeah. But there will be plenty of moments to ask our questions over the course of the day. We've got about seven minutes until our next talk, so do the, the swapping, the bio break, the get your snack, and let's say thanks again to Leanne. Thank, Thank you. you.